Hi everyone, we're back. Here we are in sports nutrition, getting closer to the end here. Today's topic is going to be body composition and disordered eating. We will absolutely break this into two sections for the video. Let's just jump right in. Okay, so in this chapter, we'll be talking about um, body composition first, what it is, how to measure it, what's good for certain performances. And then the second part of this chapter, we're going to talk about some disordered eating behaviors. Okay, so as I said, we're going to start this chapter off by talking about body composition. Everyone's heard about this, but you may not be familiar with all the details. And we're going to get pretty detailed in talking about ways to assess body composition and then what a, a healthy college-aged individual where they should be and then where athletes should be. So body composition is just everything that makes up the body. Particularly, though, we would like to break it down into lean mass and fat mass. So really, our body composition is equal to all of our lean mass plus our fat mass, because those are really the only two options. Our fat mass is what you think it is, the fat tissue, the adipose. Lean mass is everything else, muscles, bones, organs. Okay. Um, we tend to measure ourselves in terms of weight, which is also lean mass versus fat mass in, in a certain way of thinking about it. And what I want to start to get through to you in this chapter is we could have someone that has the same weight. So in this picture, we have two men, both on the scale at 195 pounds. But indeed, they have different body compositions. So they have the same body weight in pounds or kilograms but different compositions of that weight so therefore we have to look at both sure we look at the scale to get our, a look at our total body weight but that doesn't in no way does it tell the whole story what's almost more important is the body composition what is the composition of that weight do we have a higher fat mass and a lower lean mass that would be less healthy? Or do we have a lower fat mass with a higher lean mass? Because what we're going to find out is the reason why these two individuals are the same body weight is because um, muscle tends to weigh just the same as fat. Or excuse me, weigh more than fat. I don't know why I just said that. Muscle weighs more than fat. So when you look at these two individuals, the guy on the right looks bigger. So in circumference, he's bigger, right? But this smaller circumference dude with less surface area ends up being the same weight because muscle weighs more than fat. So body weight doesn't tell the whole story. We've got to be looking at the body composition of that weight, right? Good. Body composition is more important. It's a better measure of overall health. Um, that differentiation is going to give us more information about our risks for diseases. And more specifically, that body composition can affect performance. And as athletes, we care about performance. And if we take it a step further, certain body compositions are advantageous for certain sports or certain positions in sports. So, indeed, a lot of things to think about. Okay. Um, poor body composition, right? Um, so, it's not just a high weight that can be a bad thing. It's the composition of that weight. So, a high weight person or a high weight person with more fat mass. Um, higher fat mass has been associated with all of these things. I'm not going to ask you this list. But a poor body composition is absolutely associated with a bunch of poor health outcomes. I'm just going to ignore that, if you would. Okay, so our basic equation is what we've already laid out. Our total body mass is equal to our fat mass plus our lean mass. We know our lean mass is muscle, bones, organ, and water. And our fat mass is the adipose tissue. 
we already introduced this, right? Um, here's what it should look like, and I'm not going to ask you these specific numbers, but the reason I brought this out is because it gives you the difference between men and women, the blue and the pink. Men, by nature, are going to have more muscle, so we just have to understand that and expect that compared to women. Women are going to have more fat compared to men. It's just the way that we are born and built physiologically. But there's also this thing called essential fat. And these are the darker ones. So the essential fat is darker. So a certain percentage of our overall fat is essential. And that means that we need it. Uh, I'm going to come back to talking about that. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to talking about the essential fat, um, but just introduce it. Essential fat is fat that we need to function. And of course, it's absolutely normal to have some extra fat. Um, so that can both be normal, but physiologically, we can s create a subsection of that that is quote unquote essential, vital for our body in order to be able to live. Here's what a <clears throat> normal breakdown would look like based on this, right? You don't need to know these. Um, this is what the percentages would look like, but I'm not going to ask you that. But I do want to talk more about this essential fat. So we basically have two different categories of fat. We have that essential fat. And more specifically, this is the minimum amount that we need to live minimum amount. So if a male has only 3% body fat, they are at the minimum. They're knocking on the door of being unhealthy, too little. Women, 12% is that minimum amount, right? So this is the minimum amount that we need to live. It's vital because fat plays an important role in our body. It protects our organs, makes up the cell membrane. We had a whole chapter on fat. So fat is important. The essential fat is the minimum amount of fat that we need to stay alive. How about that? Essential fat is the minimum amount of fat that we need to stay alive. And we also have more than that, and that's normal. I would suggest to you it's normal to have some of both. Normal to have some of both because this is the absolute minimum you're knocking on, on the door of not having enough, which can have um, you know, negative consequences as well. So the storage fat is just as it implies, it's kind of the above, the above minimum amount, um, but it's good. We, we want some of this also, folks. We want some, but not too much. And of course, having this extra storage fat gives us more insulation, keeps us warm, gives us more energy. So we still want some of this. And then of course, in addition to having different amounts of fat, women carry more fat than men, men and women carry fat differently. And this is a simplistic view, but it's been out in the world for a while because in many instances it's true, not always. Right, we're not getting at specific here, but in general, in general, men tend to store more of their fat in their chest and their belly. Right? Chest and belly. Whereas women tend to store more of their fat in their hips. And this can make men and women a little bit more susceptible to different types of health conditions. So because men tend to store more fat, and this is, of course, extra storage fat. We're talking about excess, right? Because men tend to store more in their chest and their um, belly, they tend to be a little bit more likely to have a heart attack. Women are more likely to have other conditions because they tend to store fat more in their hips. Okay, so before we go farther, it's the age-old question, how much fat should we have overall? 
And this would be our essential plus storage. So our overall body fat. How much should it be? Well, you can look in a book. Oh, look at the age groups. Or the, excuse me, the percentages and then rating of ath athletics. I like to keep it simple. For college age men and women. College age men and women. These are the recommended ranges. Men between 10 and 20% body fat, women between 20 and 30% body fat. Now the athlete would tend to fall on the lower end. Someone in a general population might fall towards the higher end. But for all college-aged individuals, these are healthy body fat percentage ranges. Now a couple things. Listen, I've got friends, I've got female friends who say to me, Dr. Jenkins, well, they don't call me Dr. they call me Christine. Christine, are you sure? Are you sure that women, come on, I'm a woman. You mean to tell me it's normal for me to be 30% body fat? Yes. <laughs> you know, women maybe get a little bit disillusioned. They get a sense of false normal because we look at magazines. We look at what actresses look like. Oh, they're really skinny. That's not the normal, folks. Our biology as a woman, we need more body fat. It's all about preparing the body to nurture a baby. So it's absolutely normal. Now, what if someone is, oh my God, 32%. Are they a fat piece of crap and they're going to die? No. Right? What if a woman, what if a female runner is 18? Oh my God, she's too skinny. No. So it's a range. It's not meant to be absolute. But it gives us a ballpark. And it shows us how significant the differences are between men and women. And these should be accepted and understood. So know this, if you're a little above and below, that's okay. Now, as we get older, remember, these are the recommendations for college aged. As we get older, as we get older, we tend to store more body fat, especially women, the effects of estrogen. As we get older, we tend to be less active because our bodies are not as good as they once were before, right? So as we get older, these will be a little bit higher. Maybe for someone who's middle-aged, maybe for women, it goes 25 to 35%. And for men, 15 to 25 middle age. I don't know. It goes up a little bit. So I'm just pointing out, trying to be very clear, these recommendations I'm giving are for college-aged men and women. Now, let's talk about performance. Body composition can affect performance. It's difficult to study the exact relationship because so many things go into someone's athletic performance. Um, there's some sports where it might play more of a role. Think about a football lineman, bigger, more mass is better. Do we know the difference between someone who has 20% body fat and 15% body fat? Who's the better lineman? Well, it's not only due to their body fat percentage. It's due to their technique, their training, their genetics. So it's hard to pin it down. But we do know that certain body compositions can influence in a positive or negative way performance. Be able, folks, be able to give some examples of sports that benefit from a lower body fat percentage. Marathon runners, gymnasts, wrestlers, triathletes, and cyclists, they tend to have very low body fat percentages. If you think about a runner, a distance runner, a distance runner, they're trying to move their body across a certain distance. And the longer distance they have to move that body, uh, the more stress it is. So if you weigh less, and you, can, and you can devote all of your mass to, or the most of it is possible to lean mass, you're going to be better off. 
And then where higher body fat might be something where more strength and, you know, force behind your body is beneficial. Then there's some in the middle. So just be able to to think about that. And also, um, you know, there's some sports where the body composition is part of the performance. Think about gymnasts. Think about figure skaters. These are types of athletes where divers and swimming and diving, divers, these are types of athletes where how they look plays a role because they're partially aesthetic sports. It's not just how fast you can run. It's not just how much weight you can lift. It's how good do you look when you do the certain gymnastics motion. Okay, here are some examples of what might be a desired body fat percentage range for different athlete types. I'm not going to ask you this, but just for reference, if you'd like it. Can a body fat percentage be too low? Yes. Remember, we talked about that essential fat, the minimum amount that you need. If you go below that minimum amount, could be dangerous. We need fat. Protects our organs, makes up cell membranes, helps to form hormones, gives us energy. So if you don't have enough body fat, your body is going to start to lose lean mass. You're not going to have as much energy. You're more at risk for injury. Because you don't have enough fat for energy, you might start to burn more protein for energy. And that protein could be taken from muscles. Females may lose their period, amenorrhea. The body starts to shut down, which is actually a bad thing, folks. So know these. And again, it depends. Um, you know, I, um, for example, I was an athletic trainer for a Division One wrestling collegiate team. And we had some men who were 5% body fat who were very healthy, right? I would be uncomfortable at 3%. But 5%, they were healthy. Um, but someone else, another another male athlete for wrestling at 5% might look too low because part of it's genetics. We're put together. Some of us have a wider frame versus a leaner frame. So it's, there's all sorts of things to consider, but these are some ballpark ranges for you. Okay, so how do we determine what is best for an athlete? Okay, so consider the sport. Consider the body type of the athlete. You know, this came out um, at the University of Oregon with their running coach, uh, Alberto Salazar, came out with uh, the Nike running project that these male coaches were pushing extremely low body fat percentages for female athletes. And if they didn't get down to a certain number, they would be punished. And that doesn't take the person into consideration. You know, through genetics, I'll be the first to tell you. Um, I mean, I know I'll meet you in person, but maybe you've seen a picture of me. I posted some pictures of me doing the Ironman. Um, I'm in shape, but I'm, I'm by far a really, really lean athlete. My genetics <laughs> are not that lean, folks. <laughs> so my parents, um, you know, we're not huge, but they weren't lean. We're a broad-shouldered family. We're a big-boned family. So 12% body fat percentage on me, I can tell you, would be too low. But then I've got friends who come from genetic backgrounds um, where it's more lean. So 12% if they were eating well would be okay. So you have to consider the athlete, particularly a, a woman and um, men too, but holding into a certain number, um, not considering their genetics or other factors, 12% body fat is not the same for everyone. Okay. Um, you can use an equation if you want to think about what should your ideal body fat percentage be, but I'm not going to ask you that, nor do I think it's the be all end all. I don't think we can put everything to an equation. So you have to be realistic. We have to look within those ranges. You have to trial and error, see what your body can handle. Okay. So let's talk about ways in which we can assess body composition. Here we go. Now, we're going to first talk about not body fat percentage, but just weight. I can put someone on a scale. 
Well, it's easy to use. It's inexpensive. It gives us some information. If someone is 5'5 five five and they're 300 pounds, that gives us some information. I doubt that it's a problem of body, comp body composition. It's a problem... Oh, or excuse me, I doubt that it's something that we can see here where we have two men of the same weight but different body composition. No matter who you are, five, five, three hundred pounds is probably too much, right? But weight only gives us certain information. It does not tell us the type of body mass. It does not distinguish lean versus fat. So these two individuals, both 195 pounds, the weight doesn't give us that much information. <clears throat> so the next thing I came along was body mass index, BMI, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. The BMI can be obtained from a chart or it can be obtained from a formula. Let's look at the chart. Basically, BMI is a height and weight chart because on one side, I've got height on the y-axis. On the x-axis, I have weight. So it's really a height-weight chart. I'll use myself. I'm about 150, and I'm about 5'9". So if I follow this down, and I follow this across, I'm probably what my BMI is, 22.5. Right? I fall right about here. Okay, considering that, the red area is a healthy weight. So judging by this height and weight chart, my BMI is a 22.5. It's within the healthy range. Here are the normal values. Anywhere between 18.5 and 25. Some people will say just between 18 and 24, something like that. It's considered normal weight. That's the red area in this chart. Then we have overweight green, obese yellow, underweight blue. You can also do it through a formula, taking your weight in pounds, multiply by 703, divide by your height squared. Okay, what are the, the, the positives? Oh, it's easy, it's free, it's standard. As a matter of fact, a lot of huge studies that are done in science where they have hundreds of thousands, even thousands of people, um, it's so easy to use, right? So it is used in some research, but boy, it's got a lot of negatives because it's only looking at height and weight. So I suppose it's a little bit better than just a scale because it incorporates height, but not that much better because look, look at these two gentlemen. Two gentlemen, same height, same weight. Their BMI is the same. Let's see, 195, six feet tall. Let's look at it. 195, six feet. 26.5. So their BMI is 26.5. Okay, but that doesn't tell us where the two are. If I look at the healthy range, that was 26.5. According to that, these two gentlemen are overweight. Are both gentlemen overweight? No. This one might be a little bit overweight, but this one is healthy. So BMI is a lot of problems. It does not take into account type of weight. It also, for the record, doesn't take into consideration age or gender. I don't like this measurement, folks. I've had students tell me that they've got kids in middle school and high school and they go see the nurse and they get their BMI number and if it's over a certain amount, they get a letter, a note sent home to their family. Come on. So while it's used in a lot of large-scale research because it's easy, um, it doesn't take into account type of mass. And if you are muscular, if I'm muscular, I'm going to weigh more. What if I was 160 instead of one? 50, right? What if I was 160 and I was 5'6"? Oh, overweight. What if I just had massive muscles? It would tell me I'm overweight when I'm not. So this, had a, this has a tendency to tell us more people are overweight than they are. Make sure you review some of the major pros and cons. 
Here's our same example, two people, same height. It's a different example, but same idea. Same height, same weight, different BMIs. Both would be considered obese. Can be misleading. So now you know. Okay. So we talked about weight, talked about BMI, which is a height and weight. And now we're getting into something that's a little bit more specific. Still not great. But there is something that you can measure called the waist to hip ratio. It is exactly what it sounds like. We take a tape measure, we go around the narrowest part of the waist, we take a circumference. We take a tape measure and go around the widest part of the hips and take a circumference. And you just divide. You divide your waist value by your hips value. This body composition would be considered unhealthy if for females the value is greater than 0.8 or if for males the value is greater than 0.91. So it does give a little more information than BMI. It's easy, but still we're only measuring two particular sites. Two particular, two particular sites out of the whole body is not really that much. So I'm not saying these are all terrible. I suppose they all have a place, um, but when possible, it's better to use some other methods. And of course, the best way to really assess body composition is by measuring body fat percentage. Oh, yes, my friends, body fat percentage. Because this is going to give us that holy grail number, fat mass. And once we have fat mass, we can figure out lean mass. We can just take total weight minus fat mass to get lean mass. So now we have more information. Not only do we have the total weight, but we have how much of that weight is lean versus fat. We're going to talk about all these different methods to measure body fat percentage. Okay. Back in the old days, and what I mean, folks, is 20 years ago, 20, actually, um, 8, 9, 10, 24 years ago, almost 25, 24 years ago, I graduated high school and went into college, right? 24 years ago. 20 plus years ago, this is the method that I use, hydrostatic weighing. It used to be the gold standard. And when I say gold standard, I mean the most accurate way to measure body fat percentage. So what you would do is, is you would submerge someone in water. And before that person got submerged, there was a known volume of water. When, when they submerged, um, the water rose a certain level. I call this the cannonball test, right? If a person that has more body fat does a cannonball into a pool, there's more water displaced. Um, it's great. It's really accurate. It's still really accurate. But it's time consuming. You got to have a, this particular expensive system. The person's got to get wet. That's not fun. So for these, you should know um, what the technique is and how it's done. So hydrostatic way, very accurate way of measuring body fat percentage, measures water displacement by putting someone in water. Now, the more current gold standard is the bod pod. We actually have one here at Hudson Valley Community College. So instead of me measuring water displacement, we measure air displacement. This little capsule has a known volume of air. You put someone in there in a spandex, bathing suit for women or for men, compression shorts and no shirt, and it measures air displacement, very accurate doesn't require being put into water, but it's expensive, requires some training to use. We call this the bod pod, yeah. The actual method is called air displacement plethysmography bod pod. Another gold standard is DEXA. Now these are all pretty expensive. The hydrostatic weighing, the bod pod, and the DEXA, and we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, right? But they're, the reason they're so expensive is because they're accurate. In a DEXA scan, someone lays down and this little unit kind of moves across you slowly and through 
a sort of x-ray technology. It's able to x-ray your body and gives us a mapping of lean versus fat mass. It's really accurate. This actually also gives us some other information. It gives us information on bone density, which is helpful. But it's expensive. Um, yeah. So again, know what the technique is called and basically how it works. Now let's get into some techniques that don't cost tens of thousands of dollars for body fat percentage. What about the good old fashioned skin fold? You know, we got those calipers and you pinch certain areas of skin. This used to be more common. I don't think as much anymore. Um, the problem with this is that it takes a lot of training. So there's particular sites, um, kind of between the nipple and the armpit, right below the belly, right beside the belly button, the thigh. Um, there's this one I call the spare tire measurement, kind of right a diagonal pinch right above the diagonal of the hip. We got the thigh, we got the tricep. Sometimes you'll do the calf or the kidney. There's all sorts of sites. It's cheap. It can give valid results, but it requires training. And this isn't the kind of training like the bod pod where you push some buttons on a computer screen. This is hands-on training. Um, I used to do this for the wrestlers where I was at 20 some years ago for the division one wrestlers. Uh, and I got pretty good at it. So it was reasonable accuracy. It was the same person, me, always doing it each week, and I got reasonably accurate. Um, usually the error is about 3 to 5% if you are well-trained. Now, if you're not well-trained, that's going to go through the roof. Once you get those numbers, once we get those skin fold numbers, we have to put them into a formula, and that can be kind of a pain in the butt. If you were lucky, you were given a, um, like an Excel spreadsheet that already had the formulas put in there, so you could just enter in the sum of the skin fold sites and it would spit it out for you. Okay. Another, and this is becoming much more popular, bioelectrical impedance, whether it's something that you hold onto with your hands like the unit in this picture. Sometimes it's a scale where you step on the scale with your bare feet and it has this silvery looking little platform. The BIA, how it works is it sends a small electrical current through your body. And that current travels at different speeds, whether it's traveling through fat mass or lean mass. You don't feel it. This is becoming a lot more popular. Um, some of the negatives, it's very sensitive to hydration. Uh, so it's very sensitive to hydration. It's not as accurate as people think. Um, I know it's more fun because it's easy and it's a little unit you can just step on. Ooh, it's easy. Um, so it's, it's okay if given the choice. Perhaps call me old-fashioned. I'd rather be trained on the skin fold. Um, I get more information about each site so I can see body composition changes at each site. It is more accurate, the skin fold, if done properly. But that is a big ask. So a lot of gyms will have BIA units now. Another cool one... We actually have one of these also at Divide Community College. It's something called NIR, or Near Infrared Interactance. It's got a little probe, and that probe shoots a light through the tricep, bicep, excuse me. So you set it up, you put that little, that little light thing right up against the middle of the biceps brachii on the arm, press a button, it sends a light through it, and that light will travel at different speeds through dense, fat, or leaner tissue. It's fast, not invasive. Um, it's somewhat accurate. It's getting better. So, so many options, folks. In your chapter outline, there's a nice summary table that you can fill in what these techniques are and what their pros and cons are. Okay, we're going to end the first half of this chapter here, and we'll come back for part two.